everybody, and I cannot do this. I'm sorry, guys. You take care of this. I'm out. Oh no, James, no. come back. No, no, no. no. Co- co- tie him down. Bye. Tie him down. No, no. You yes. will not make me talk about this. That's not a word. You are not going to make me talk about. This. <laughs> okay, you fine. I will. <laughs> yeah, we got a comic to review. Okay, and that's what me Americans call diplomacy. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with this format. All right, all right. I will, I will tell you where the rebel base is, but you're not going to make me talk about this comic. Okay. Fine, fine. And today, with putting my sanity at risk, you're going to be talking about the issues 27 and 28 of the main comic series of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, published by IDW, uh, with art by Andy Price and writing by Katie Cook, with colors by the always awesome Heather Brackel. And these are t- uh, labeled as The Revenge of the Everfree, if it's, uh, if I recall correctly. And as you have already heard, I have here with me Norman Sanso and awesome uh, prony reviewer Silver Quill. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am Captain Planet. <laughs> oh, God. That Turner is coming back and if, he decided to take if, all the likability out of his products. If he's Captain mm. Planet, I want to be the blue cat people from Avatar. Mm. Oh, I want I to be Kevin it. Costner in Dances with Wolves. <laughs> or in this case, Dances with Deers. Yeah. Mm. Well, My gosh. I, so guys, should we uh, paint with Colors of the Wind? Actually, first I think we need to make just a tiny correction. Uh oh. This is, this arc is not called The Revenge of Everfree. That's part one. Oh. The huh? whole thing, the whole thing is called The Root of the Problem. Huh. And believe me, we can point to the root of the problem with this comic. I, I, I honest to God want to know what the root of the problem is because to be perfectly honest, I have no idea. What is wrong with this comic? There are so many things wrong with it, but there are, there are also so many other things that could have been great. Uh, okay, oh. we're going to jump right into spoilers, guys, uh, mm-hmm. which includes like our opinion on it and what we think of the comic and our recommendation whether you should buy it or not. Spoiler alert, you shouldn't. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, a spoiler from now on, if you haven't read it, don't. Save your life. Uh, but if you have, go ahead and keep listening to us. Uh, first impressions, guys. What did you think of this comic? Oh, at first I was so intrigued. I mean, we were going to the depths of the Everfree and there was this unknown threat that was causing the Everfree to expand so aggressively and all the creatures were even more aggressive, which given their default, that's really aggressive. <laughs> And then we were introduced to this new race hidden within uh, Everfree. And while I know for a lot of people that was almost an instant attraction, I thought it was really awesome. And then we meet our villain. What? <laughs> I just like, what? No, no, no. You're, comic, you're doing so well. Turn away. Turn away. Oh, God. It's like suddenly a car going at 100 miles per hour, and you're like, yes, this is great. And then suddenly down to zero. Oh, God. And, and then, then it you... starts going backwards. Uh... Towards towards an oncoming traffic. And you can see the crash coming. You're like, no! Uh... You, don't see, you, just, you just don't see the crash coming. You see the car crashing onto every single car. And it keeps killing people, setting everything on fire, destruction everywhere. Uh... That was a pretty bad analogy. But it, it, is, it is kind of like that. Uh, uh, what, what, what about you, Norman? Page 13. Page 13. This is the page where I just... What? Oh, God. Is this comic? Is this kind of story, isn't it? Oh, no. There's something in writing where they say that all stories are just rehashes. Oh, yes, there are only seven plots in the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are only seven plots in the world. That is and... the main six on Celestia. <laughs> uh, uh, what about Luna? But no, is there's only story <laughs> plots in the world. The <laughs> there's only seven story plots in the world. And when I first read the whole, not really first read, when I just read through the page, I, I found it like, hey, this is cool. wonder what could it be? Is it something to do with the... Elements of harmony, you know, the tree of harmony, blah, blah, blah. Or is it some kind of um, thing, something? And then, like, okay, a deer pops up. 
Okay, what could this be? Okay, this is interesting. And then, page 13. Deer gets pissed off. And then, we see that the deer has magical powers to do something. And, it's this kind of story, ain't it? Ah. It's not saying that it's not right, or it's not fun, or it's wrong, or... How do I put, how do I put this gently? This kind of story is hard to tell. The story that they're trying to tell us, it's hard to pull off. And the investment in time, I, I don't know how to put this. Like, what do you guys think of uh, James Cameron's Avatar? Oh my god, damn it. Do you really want to ask us that? Yeah, because I, I want to know. I just want to know what do you guys think about that one. Okay. Go ahead, Silver. Go first. Go first. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it, uh, I agree with people when they say that it has a cookie cutter plot. It is every sort of, there's a, there's a trope name on TV tropes, Mighty Whitey, <laughs> the great, the great white hero who comes to lead the native people to victory over the invaders, but they're pretty much useless without him. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's this movie in a nutshell. That said, I was swept up by the visuals, the design of, of Pandora. And so, in some ways, I kind of appreciated that the plot was simplistic because then I could sit back and get swept up in the visuals of this thing. The only trick is I've only seen it in the theaters. I've yet to watch it on home video. It may not have the same effect. I'm very much of the opinion of uh, uh, Silver is that, yeah, the movie has a simplistic, stupidly silly story, but and uh, it is very preachy in many points. There is a lot of finger wagging in front of the viewer saying, ah, you see, this is an analogy for what's happening with Earth. If you don't do the same, then Earth is going to end up dying like in the movie. Like, yeah, okay, we get it. Just stupid movie. But at the same time, the characters are great. The acting is awesome. Like, so is Aldana as Neytiri. is just unbelievable. You, you, you forget that the characters are made with computers. There is no uncanny valley. The, the, the visuals are so pretty. It's one of the prettiest movies that has been released in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just for the, for the design alone, is super good. Uh, besides, it's one of those science fiction movies that doesn't do what science fiction usually does, that makes the aliens the bad guys. Like It's funny because in that movie, the bad guys are the humans. Mm -hmm. There is a shifting in your perspective when... You are actually rooting for these aliens eating and killing the humans because the humans are the villains. That was something that I really, that I actually really like because it's, it's unusual. And the character of Colonel Quaritch is just so much fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, like the guy who plays Cor the Colonel in the movie, the, the bad guy, he is having a ball <laughs> yeah. playing that guy and he's having so much fun. So yeah, yep. it is a very enjoyable movie. Um, I I got it on DVD. I got the, the the extended edition, and it it still holds up because it's a very turn your brain off and enjoy a very pretty movie with pretty visuals mm -hmm. that doesn't get thankfully doesn't get muddled with the finger wagging as much as uh, as the worst episodes of Captain Planet could be, or <laughs> or Fern Gully or or Pocahontas or any of the other movies that uh, people accused it to be a copy of. All right. So yeah. And as for me, I like the movie for its visuals. The story is simple, and whatever you guys said, I totally agree. And now, with that in mind, what do you think of this one? Do they do things right with what you guys said about Avatar and compare oh. with this one? Because no. I, no. I felt a few things were done right, and a few things were... What were there's, you thinking? There are so many things wrong with this comic. There is... Oh god, I didn't even give my first impressions. Will you guys want to hear my first sure, impressions? Sure. <sighs> when I first started reading the comic, it was so enjoyable because I was very much like you guys thinking, oh, maybe this is coming from the Tree of Harmony. Maybe this is, this is another explanation. There is something going on in the Everfree Forest that is causing all of this to happen. And, uh, it was great to see a new race, a new species being introduced in the comics in such a, such a dignified manner that I always saw the Everfree Forest as its own ecosystem with its own society, its own rules and all that. And the show has only scratched its surface. So to present the, uh, the deers as the elves from, from Loth, or Lothlorien, from Lord of the Rings, they basically live on the trees. That is Lothlorien, okay? 
in, in page 16, that beautifully rendered panel where you see the entrance of the, to the, to the, uh, the sanctuary of the deers and all that. And I'm like, that is so cool. Oh, wow. What are we going to see there? What are we going to see? Oh my God. Look at that. The deer, the, 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 the leader of the, of the deer. He's reminding me of Princess Mononoke. Oh my God. That is so cool. What is it going to go? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no! <laughs> you were going so well, comic. Why were you? Why would you do this to me? It is, it is a betrayal of the trust of the reader, the confidence that someone who is buying this comic puts on the ones writing it. Yeah. This is coming from Katie Cook and Andy Price, the guys who managed to make a comic out, an epic story out of nothing. With the big Macintosh arc. Mm -hmm. And then they throw this curveball so much that it hits you right on the temple and it knocks you out. And when you wake up, you find out that you have been waterboarded to a chair. No. You don't do this to me. Comic. Ah! Well, it's no point in us going through, to, going through this one slowly. So why not we just try and go get into it? Like, let's try get into it, man. Yeah, let's start from the very beginning. Yep. From the very beginning. Oh, always good to start from the beginning. Would you like me to try and tackle Le Summarization? You know what? Yes. I think, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I hate to give you more work because you're supposed to come here to have fun, review the comic with us and all that. And now you're going to be doing my job. It makes me feel so, it, it makes me feel responsible and guilty. I don't want to give you more work to do, man. You have enough. Well, don't, don't worry about it. It's just sort of rereading the comic. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm rereading the comic. No, it's all good. Don't worry. Don't worry. Besides, I like to summarize. So we start with the root, the revenge of Everfree, part one of the root of the problem with, uh, picnic number 573. I sincerely wonder how these ponies get anything done. Well, if the picnic doesn't last long as Zakura shows up fleeing from timber wolves, which I gotta give, uh, uh, Andy Price credit. He really conveys the, the texture of the timber wolves, even though they're, they're mostly just a monotone brown. Uh, I drew timber wolves for one review and it took the be it took half a day for just two poses because the, the, there's no, no wonder they used CG for a spike at your service. Those things are hard to draw, but right off of the bat, we get uh, some dialogue from the ponies that really shows that they're going too hard for the joke. You have Rarity demanding to know why she has to help save someone's life. Uh, Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash are having sort of side conversations. And they're all, Pinky's worrying about a cake. And they're all just standing around talking while Sakura's fleeing in the background. And the thing I say to myself is, you could still have this dialogue as they're chasing the Timberwolves. Combine action with dialogue and you get the best of both worlds. Exactly. You don't have the characters just standing there. Besides, uh, I think that was was that it started annoying me from the very beginning. Why is Rarity saying, why do I have to help? Uh, because of these other many times that you have helped in the show where you didn't even question why you were helping, but you just helped? Like, oh, why should I fix that cartwheel on Main Hat? And, oh, they're not going to give me anything in exchange. I mean, okay, fixing a cartwheel and fighting Timberwolves is uh, two different things, but this is not the rarity that I know and love. Uh, funny, because Andy Price and Katie Cook love to do rarity, and yeah, they love to, they love to do rarity, so I, I don't know what went wrong. <laughs> Although I do love Twilight's battle plan. I will defeat the Timberwolf on the right. All five of you are needed to tackle the Timberwolf on the left. Oh, at I, least well, she's being honest. <laughs> at, at least she's not trying to go for the whole, I can't, I can't use magic against non-magical beings. Ugh, oh, well, guess, remember, remember. <laughs> Monster. Yeah, 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 there is that double standard. Oh, God. <laughs> Our, um, oh, I, sh I, should let that go. I should let that go. Truthfully, speaking of magic... This is the first time Rarity has ever used offensive magic in any medium. Not in the show, not in the comics until now, and to my knowledge, not in the books. Hmm. It's a, actually it's kind of funny that while Rainbow boosts that they boasts that they've got it, it's Applejack and Rarity who who solve the problem. Working together, solving the problem. And the Timberwolves are self-cleaning; they just poof. 
on. Wow. Well, then again, if you see that, Rainbow and Pinkie Pie do nothing. Fluttershy, of course, Pacifist, she doesn't do anything as well. The only ones attacking the, the Timberwolves are Applejack and Rarity. And Pinkie Pie is more eyes. concerned about the cake than anything else. <sighs> This I, okay. Before we start recording, right? I asked James this: Has Pinkie Pie gotten more annoying in the show and comics? And I posted out this to you, Silver. Like, has she? In the show, no, and maybe not even in the comics. In in the sense that I like Pinkie stopped talking. More that I feel her humor is being presented as oblivious rather than a unique spin on the situation. One of my favorite jokes for Pinky is where, in the very first episode, she finds the books on the Elements of Harmony, and Twilight asks, how did you find that? She says, I, under- I mean, and that, I just, that, that was funny, but what, what I mean, what I meant to say was, like, in the current issue, in the current state of how Pinky is after season, or during season four, and in this book, like, in the few books that we have, because, mm-hmm. like, in the cowboy arc, she was, oh my god, would you please stop it? And in this one, she's borderline making me rage. That sort of ties in with what I mean about the humor at the start of episode one of the series versus here. That was Pinky looking at the situation and finding a funny perspective. I mean, you know, sort of charming in its simplicity. Here, she, someone's life is on the line and she's worried about cake. She is not in this moment she's her, she's larking off in another world and that's been a growing trend with her humor yeah. in both the show and the comics pinky is at her best when she's reacting to the situation but with a different twist than others not when she's larking off on her own tangent while everyone else is trying to solve a problem the problem with pinky pie is that when the story doesn't focus on her she is among the worst characters because look at the pinky pie micro Pinkie Pie is awesome in that micro. Mm-hmm. Or uh, 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 Pinkie Pride, the episode with with cheese sandwich. She's awesome in that episode. Then the, the episode right after, uh, the, the Philip Vanilli episode, she is an absolute pain in the ass. I mean, when she's not the focus of the story, she becomes a problem. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I've been saying about Pinky. I mean, um, sorry to any Pinky lovers out there, but I... I Pinky's my least favorite or the main six just because of certain things. Like, same this, here. This one is, she's really grinding on my gears. Like, ugh. Same here. She has become a very big nuisance when she's not the focus, which is funny. You would expect the opposite, but no. Uh, anyway, oh. we are drifting apart talking about, about Pinky Pie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there, there's so much more to get angry about. Like, there, like Ponyville is under attack by Everfree Vines. Oh, no. Again. Wait, again? again? Oh yeah, yes. the first one was the. Oh yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, yeah. these aren't these aren't plunder vines. There's, but the rule thirty four implications are still there. Ah, uh, tentacles. No, no, no. Moving on, moving on. No, uh, not moving on. Give me uh, the tentacles. Uh, oh, no, no, come on, dude. This was a theme. Besides, if we skip this part, we can't say how awesome Granny Smith is. How many people? <laughs> how many people can purse smack a forest? <laughs> nah, it's it's pretty straightforward. Sakura's been chased out by these uh by this aggressive growth. Ponyville is under attack. Uh, for we get the first instance where sweet cre- sweet cream scoops is not hitting on Big Macintosh because they're both under attack. <laughs> well, if they're not, they <laughs> they had a chance there. <laughs> Looks like Shirley has some competition. She's not, she's not hitting on Big Macintosh because the the binds are hitting on her. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, no. And so our ponies do something that is actually smart. They send a letter to the reigning nobles, the most magical and not knowing uh, beings in the land. But apparently, it's just not Celestia's day for spell check. Why? What happened? Uh, when they get a reply letter saying that the vines are assaulting uh, Canterlot as well, if you look on the second paragraph, first line, the vines making are... th- their way, it's I before E, but this is one of those rare exception, exceptions. That, that happens. It's... That happens before as well. Last line of the first paragraph is also spelled wrongly. It's there, not dear. There. Oh. Uh, well, I'm curious. They got it's... the same. 
They got it wrong twice. It's okay, I man. It, it's okay. You like, know what? Uh, I am going to use the same reasoning that Team Plan Philosophy does and say that horses are illiterate and they don't know how to spell. <laughs> because they are horses. I mean, <laughs> come on. Yeah, right. it's weird. Once is a typo. Twice is like, are you doing this on purpose? Probably. <laughs> and I just think, but either way, come on. This is Princess Celestia. Spelling counts. I'm sorry, <laughs> Celestia. Oh, See? God. This reminds me of a fan fiction. See me there, after class. There, dear. Yeah, that there, one. There, <laughs> that there, one. there, there. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. And have, I do, you heard and I... that, have you heard of that fan fiction, Silver? Let's see here. Uh, I know of one where it's called You're Beautiful. <laughs> uh, where Twilight gets a love letter, but all she can focus on is the poor spelling. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. And she starts taking steps to educate Ponyville in proper oh, uh, grammar and editing. <laughs> Oh God, that sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> I never, I never saw, read the ending though. But uh, regardless, uh, I love Twilight's reaction to this letter. That basically, Celestia says it's up to you to go in and talk to the heart of the Everfree Forest <laughs> and ask for help. And her first reaction is, she wants me to go in there to find How who? Often? To find who? <laughs> oh <laughs> man, this reminds me of Guardian of the Galaxy. Who? Ah, uh, sorry. I just had to the heart of the forest, man. <laughs> and I just love that for the first time. I mean, ne- not once when Celestia says, oh, you have to go to Ponyville. Oh, you have to fight Discord. Oh, you have to uh, go to the Crystal Empire but not and not let your friends help. Oh, you have we have to give you our magic. Not once does Twilight say, sister, you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Celestia, you know that. That's not a word. That's going on at the Everfree Forest. I'm not going to step in there. You're crazy. Uh... I mean, give me a break. Now, meanwhile, Fluttershy has, quotes a problem I've had with the Everfree uh, <laughs> since the show's beginning. For a place that used to be the area from which no pony has ever returned, they've strolled in and out with impunity many times now. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of refreshing for her to say, we've been in there lots of times. It can't be that bad. And then nearly get decapitated by a claw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. This is evil. Then we get some creepy face Pinkie Pie. <laughs> Which is and, starting to become a, a, a trend with any <laughs> Andy Price comic. Yeah, yeah. And the ponies break their way in only to be confronted by giant vampire bats, an owl bear, a hydra, a puma bat, and what I am going to assume is a drop bear, but may just be a koala that never got any eucalyptus. <laughs> those, those things are crazy scary if they don't get their fix. I know. Carn- carnivorous koala. Quick, roll for, an, for initiative. <laughs> Oh no! I want to, I got I want to think that 10. I want to think that the, I want to think that the owl bear is a D and D reference. It is. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Owl bear yes. only exists in D and D. Well, it's also a reference to the Luna Micro. She <laughs> fought an owl bear. Oh god! Yeah. Right, right, right. Also written think... by by Katie Cook. Continuity. Yay! Continuity. <laughs> Although the the ponies do roll a high initiative because they go <laughs> and run away. <laughs> Run away! Run away! No, the alarm routine! No, the alarm routine! <laughs> Quick! If you go in zigzag, he will not see you! Stop <laughs> moving! Focus on the lion! Attack the dominant animal! <laughs> Hit its weak point for, ma- weak point for massive damage! <laughs> uh, we are not, we are totally not focusing on the comic, are we? <laughs> I don't wanna to focus on this comic! <laughs> I don't oh, but, wanna! Oh, but we get what's, what actually is the start of a pretty good message. This started out with a good environmental message in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Because the ponies block the monster's paths by knocking over trees and forming a barricade. And Pinkie Pie looks even scarier on, with her teen pony face than she does, she did trying to imitate Frankenstein. I have to wonder, Fluttershy says, what is wrong with them attacking like that with no provocation? When have they ever needed a provocation? Well, you yeah. have to remember, this is Fluttershy you're talking about. The, the girl who was chased by a hydra? No, she was never chased by a hydra, remember? She yeah, was she a... was. Was she? She was chased by, she was chased by a hydra with oh, Pinkie yeah. Pie and Twilight. Yeah, she was Feeling... flying, that's why I don't remember. Uh, and, assaulted by, and assaulted by a cockatrice. Uh, she was afraid of star spiders, though I still can't mm. figure out why. Oh, man. She uh, uh, she also looked at uh, the, those two monsters in the first issue fight each other and go, nature is so fascinating. <laughs> so it is obvious that she's not spooked by 
or if she's a spook, she's getting used to dealing with monsters. Yeah. That comment is kind of like needless and out of nowhere. But here we go. Here's where things start to get either love it or hate it. Yeah. A, a deer appears. I'm assuming it's a it's a buck, so can't really make dough a deer. Yeah. Uh, Bramble, prince of the forest, who's more concerned about the trees than the fact that these uh, seven visitors nearly just got killed. So right off the bat, kind of skewed priorities there, mm. in my eyes. A tree Free can grow ha- back. <laughs> A tree can go back from a stump. A pony can't. So we have Bramble, who's just so hostile to these ponies. Granted that he has every right to be with how the ponies are acting by destroying trees and not thinking twice about it. But come on, like, you have giant monsters coming your way. And if running and blocking the way is the only answer, do it. But if you really want to help, like, jump in and... Stop, not wag your hoof in their faces and saying that, that those poor trees, they never saw it coming. Like, no. Well, on, on the plus side, my favorite scene uh, is where Twilight fells a tree to form a bridge. And all the ponies are like, that's so clever and thoughtful. Now everyone can everyone can use it. But Bramble lights into her about how thoughtless she's being just destroying the home of, for, of forest creatures. And I think, okay, this is culture shock right here. The ponies are used to a world where they're in charge of everything. They help animals migrate and hibernate for the winter. Mm -hmm. They grow the trees and shake the leaves off. They're not used to the consequences of these actions. So they're doing what they think is good, but because they're out of their elements, it falls apart. It it blows up in their faces. Uh, Yeah, that's true because the Everfree Forest works on its own dimensions. Cloud moves from their own trees... Blah, blah, blah. I mean, all right, that's true what you say, culture shock. But it's uh, like, how do I put this? It's a, it's a fact where, Bramble, you you have a solution, right? Say it before someone does something stupid. <sighs> you know where some, how sometimes people have a reaction and you don't have the reflexes to act against what they're doing? <laughs> That's pretty much what happened. I mean, Twilight takes down the tree in a matter of one panel to another, and uh, Bramble is legitimately upset about it. I mean, try to see this from his perspective. For him, this, that's like if you take down a building to build a bridge. I mean, you will get mad as well. I mean, he goes, oh, look at you, look at what you had just did. I knew the people that were living in this tree. So, I actually like the culture shock aspect of this part of the comic. I really do, and. I I actually kind of like the character of Bramble because he's he I can see how some people can see him as annoying, but I he doesn't annoy me that much. Okay, I mean I I, 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 I can I can uh, cross most of his reaction to him being very young and very excitable and very passionate about he what he does. All right, so Besides, you know, it's it's not like he doesn't give a solution to the problem. He ends up building a bridge with those binds yeah, anyway. But here's a- Here's the thing, James. Like, Bramble here, from what I see, is he's very slow on the uptake. Like, he he knows how these ponies are. Like, he knows how they are. So, either you step up on the tempo or you just take a look-see at what they do and wag your finger at them or wag your hooves at them and telling them how evil they are. Whoa. But it isn't thing. that bad. Come on, Norman. You're being, I think you're being unfair to a character it's, okay, that, it's, doesn't, that hasn't had enough uh, enough development yet. I, I, I mean, know, but... This, it, is like, this is like the second page he's in. I know, but here's the thing. Like, certain things or certain problems with this character can be easily written off with him being proactive. And the way I look at him is he can be a better character if he just be more proactive. And remember that word, proactive, because in the second issue of this comic, he becomes proactive. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we cross that bridge. And talking about crossing bridges, Bramble, big, Bramble makes a vine bridge and they meet up with, um, Blackhorn. Blackthorn. Black, oh, Blackthorn. Blackthorn. Yes. <laughs> Blackthorn. Oh, he's going to be evil, ain't he? No, no, actually, he is going to be the coolest and most likable character in this whole dang comic. I agree. In fact, I agree. If, in fact, I, I must I must correct you, Norman. Though you you said his name mostly properly, mm-hmm. Black Blackthorn. You got to say it with proper respect, Blackthorn. 
I'm Not having, your I'm having a soul trip, so <laughs> I'm having Nobody. a soul trip, so I can't do any darkness stuff. But Blackthorn here, like, reminds me of that Ultima villain. <laughs> Yeah, you're talking about Lord Blackthorn, yep. the, guy, the bad guy from Ultima, yep. Ultima 9. It, yeah. It's negative association, but trust me, this guy's on a whole other level. I mean, his introduction in his first half is nothing terribly spectacular, but, oh Lord, later on, I will, he will become my, 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 my hero. All right. Uh, but, Shines in issue number 28, yes. But the question I have in the here and now, why are Spike and Bramble giving each other the evil eye. At the very, as they're crossing the bridge, uh, Black, Blackthorn and Twilight are talking, and the other five are just sort of walking, once again reduced to the spectator role as Twilight's adventure. Hmm. And yet there's in between, there's Spike and Bramble just looking at each other like, I will end you. <laughs> Maybe because they are at the same height, saying there is only one, there is space for just one shorty in this yeah. in this group of ponies, and you are not to be the one. You ain't getting my rarity. You ain't getting my rarity. Spike has more to worry from Blackthorn, who ra- yeah. rarity is crushing on again. This is becoming a a flanderization. Perfectly honest, that is a very good reason to crash on Blackthorn. I mean, have you looked at the way that... No, nope, no, nope, no, nope. we're not going to go oh, for man. your personal collection, James. Mm-hmm. Moving on. <laughs> anyway. No, 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 go, go on, go on. I, I do need to draw attention to one fact, that a, a bird, Calvin, <laughs> told the Heart of the Forest about Bramble and his guests, and which is why Blackthorn came out to meet them. And... We've seen Bramble interacting with the, the little creatures as well. So all the deer can communicate with animals, mm-hmm. apparently. So Does that mean that's... Buster Shai's dad is a deer? Maybe she's part <laughs> deer. <laughs> Maybe she's part deer. Who knows? Maybe her par- one of her parents is a deer. Oh, she's, dear. She, she's such a deer pony. Oh, yes. <laughs> but it's just something to keep in mind for later for a plot point. That's oh. all I'm saying. All right. And then we're there. Thickets. <laughs> the elven, the elfin town. Wait, sorry, deer town. Uh, <laughs> thicket. Where every single character in there is so thick. <laughs> oh my god, you're just so thick. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, uh, but no, honestly, this to... page, this page here, this spread, this town or city is beautiful. You, I, I didn't say anything yet about the art style in the in the comic, and yeah. I'm going to make a statement right now, guys. This is as good as it gets. It doesn't get better than this. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because Andy Price is a really good artist. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if it's time, time constraint, or regulations from Hasbro, or I don't know when where the art of Andy Price has a point where it's lately it a point where it's really good and then it's just downhill from there. Hey, I, I because would say from that. this page onwards from this page onwards the expressions are not all that compelling. The shading is really sketchy. The way that the characters are drawn is very it's very weird. I it would... is not on the same level of the the first issues. I want to think that Andy Price has been pressed on to finish these comics as soon as possible and get them out the door. And that's because the quality uh, decreases. But I tell you right now, this page is gorgeous. Very beautiful. There is there is a depth of feel in this drawing right here. That you can almost see that it's 3D. You can look into it and get lost in those woods. You want to see more. You want to get in those houses and say, oh, what is in there? I want to visit those places. I'm pretty sure the next page is going to be all about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You devil! Uh, but no, I have to disagree with you, James. The next page where um, the heart of the forest uh, is there, like that scene there, like how the heart shapes there, like how the eyes and the reveal, that is just awesome. Because Miyazaki did it first. Yeah. <laughs> well, he made it. <laughs> well, I, I I won't put uh, I won't put King Aspen on par with the uh, the forest spirit, but he does look impressive. I love the designs of the deer in this. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree. They, they they are the elves of the My Little Pony world. This yeah. is so cool. Please show us more of these characters. Nope. 
Huh. Oh, they will. And oh, the things they'll do. Oh, God, no. <clears throat> uh... Now, I'll be honest. I loved King Aspen's design, and he looked so <laughs> regal. And actually had some good lines in the first half. But then you step back. And after he says he knows about Twilight Sparkle from Celestia, and he tells the ponies to get the fudge out, he he reveals that it's them who, the deer, who have caused Everfree to spread so aggressively, the deer who have assaulted their town and destroyed their homes. And we're about to be told that the deer are the victims here. Baloney. Yes, the deer are just as bad as the actual villains, because, yeah, the, the comic wants to show that there is actually a big, big bad guy that is worse than the deer here. Well, okay. No, the deers are also being bad guys. Well, okay, what the well, hell? Here's, here's the thing, here's the thing. Like, okay, you have to remember, in a situation where diplomacy has failed, action needs to be taken, and the King Aspen has sent out many letters to Celestia, and Celestia has never replied even to one of them. So, what is this? Like, is Celestia condoning these actions by those developers? And the developers are not even taking King Aspen's in a high regard or respect. So, we're, to we're them... Getting bit, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Uh, we haven't even revealed who the bad guys are yet. Yeah, but... But, yeah, no, what Silver was saying is absolutely true, is that... Oh, we are the victims here. That's why we are invading your town and Canterlot and putting your life in peril. That's why we are doing all of this. Yeah. That's not a word. Uh, Norman, I will. I do want to address what you bring up the, about that they are the victims, that diplomacy has failed. But that comes just a little bit later after Me we... We go to the construction site of Fun Fun Land. Oh, oh go, okay, okay, okay. Everybody stop. All because right. that is the point where my heart broke. <laughs> that is, I, I was reading this on the uh. Comixology app on my tablet, and I was having such a good time. And I was going panel by panel. So <laughs> on panel two of page 19, I go there, and then Ken Aspen is like, this is happening. And I literally stopped for one minute. <laughs> and saying, saying, no. No, you're not. You're not doing what you think you're doing. You're not doing what I think you're doing. <laughs> you're not. You are not. No, this is not. Pass the next panel. That's not a word. <laughs> uh, sweetie boy's going to have a lot of words. I got so mad. I I considered shutting down the comic and stop reading because when I saw that, I was like, great. Preachy, finger-wagging. That's not a word. Spat in your faces. Where, who's writing this again? Is this Katie Cook or is Ted Turner? <laughs> he suddenly got invaded by the powers of Fern Gully, Pocahontas, Avatar, and One Dances with Wolves. Are you kidding me with this? That's not a word. God damn it. Well, Sudi Bell got to work today. Really mad, really mad. I got genuinely angry. This is the part of the comic where I actually completely lost faith in everything. I was like, yeah, no, we are, this is a straw man, this is a straw man comic. That's well, that's, it. that's the thing. Well to do, the owner of uh, Fun Fun Land, and the guy spearheading this, is so oblivious. So talk about, I love money, let's do business plan. Business, 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 money, business, progress. Business. Numbers! <laughs> He is, he is meant to be this straw man demonization of corporate greed, but he's not a character. We've just been introduced to a new race in this mysterious forest that has so much potential. You could do a grand quest based around these characters. Yes. Why? Why would you go the route of a corporate businessman who has – now, granted, I kind of appreciate that he's a minotaur, but he's a much different beast from Iron Will. But Iron Will was still a character. Yeah, and besides, Iron Will got kind of like redeemed on the on the Friends Forever with Fluttershy and him. He became a very, very likable character. So, yeah, it's like, what is it with Katie Cook making these, the bad guys always bulls or minotaurs? She did the same thing on the Wild West arc. What the hell? Well, I think Freud would take the horn sim symbolism to represent a distrust of the male character. <laughs> I don't want to go to Freud. That man uh, will touch me in places I don't want to. Oh, no. <laughs> so you're going to call Bull? Yeah, I call Bull on this. I totally call Bull on this. This is Bologna, like you just said. This is That's not a word. <sighs> go on, go. Wait. Go. Yeah, no. So, God damn. Oh. so I don't think we need to waste a lot of time talking about uh, 
Will to do's first introduction. He basically says, I'm building this place. It's progress. I don't care about nature. Yeah, I also don't care about copyright laws because I'm using all of these characters and changing one letter in their names. So I don't have to claim copyright. Ah, ha, ha. With, with, with pink Celestia toys. Oh, God. Uh, uh... Then to show that Twilight's rank truly is just air, he throws a princess out on her duff along with her friends. And I just think, wow, does this ever... Now, granted, there was a great line from King Aspen, I'm a king, and they didn't listen to me. Yeah, so... what makes you think they're going, they're going to listen to you? By the way, page 22, panel 3, Fluttershy is me towards this comic. <laughs> <laughs> You're horrible! <laughs> Psycho that's shy. Me. Yeah, yeah, that's me right there. It's like, that's my, my expression about this comic. This is horrible. Murderous intent, Fluttershy. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. This is infuriatingly insulting. What the hell are they doing with this universe? It's like, instead of expanding it and uh, keep taking advantage of the <laughs> fantasy setting that is so rich and it's so interesting and it has, like you said, it has so much potential. Why not making it about the opposite of the Tree of Harmony? Maybe it's about the Tree of Disharmony or whatever. Like, it could be so many other things. I can think of a thousand ideas that could fit much better than taking the same story that we have been told to exhaustion, because somehow the Americans still feel guilty about massacring all those Indians when they were taking over uh, over the country. Which, by the way, we Spaniards we don't feel guilty at all about massacring all those uh, all those people in South America and India when we were invading in the ni- in the fourteen in the fourteen and the thirteenth century. Okay, the- no, seriously, this is unnecessary. You could do a million different other storylines and a million different plots, but now you decide to make it a corporate uh, scheme kind of ploy, and you take the character of well to do and make him so evil just for the purpose of making the deer look like they are not the bad guys when the deer are just as bad as well to do because well to do invades the invades the everfree forest and in return the everfree forest invades Ponyville and and Canterlot. What's the difference between Keen Aspen and Well to Do aside from race? They are doing the exact same thing. Pass the herd along. Now, as the ponies are leaving, there's one other controversy. They shout to a pony, uh, mm-hmm. how can you work for, for Well to Do? And the pony responds, hey, I'm just doing my job. Your job is putting your entire country at risk. All you got to say to these ponies is, the more you cut down, the more our home is invaded. Stop. And, but, good Lord, only the most greed-driven pony is going to keep going at that no, point. No, but, okay, he, here, here's where it's hard for us to, well, for me, to, uh, how do I put this? I'm, I'm trying to defend the point of view of this pony here. It's, yeah, it's technically he's just doing his job. But I yeah, do agree but, with you guys where, okay, what he's doing is evil. But in the grand scheme of things, for this peon here... He's just yeah. a nine to five Joe Schmo who's yeah, just but doing. Norman, so are the guys that work for Spectre in the James Bond movies, and they don't have. But that's because they don't have any character. They are working for a for a secret organization that wants to take over the world. Well, okay, this that's... is just a peon working on an amusement park. You know, you know that this actually has happened, where uh, corporations have seen their businesses go bankrupt. Because the workers realized that they were working for someone that has the same amount of respect and, and, and like, goodness as Blofeld. You know that? Jesus Christ. So, uh. I, I mean, there is, the de- there is the deflection of, oh, I'm just doing my job. But there comes a point where you can't deny that anymore. Well, for and when the workers here, they're not being fed the full truth. So for them... But the full truth, they, it's right in front of their faces. The Everfree Forest is right there. You can yeah. see the stumps of the trees left. You can see what to do working from his office. And later on, you're going to see Keen Aspen forced to work in front of the, in front of the goddamn amusement park. <laughs> you can put evil bad guy, oh my god, he's, writing, he's building an amusement park without the proper license. On top of a building, and these people will still don't get, don't get the message. But, you talk about obliviousness. The working ponies are super oblivious in this one. Jesus. Actually, there's also the the fact that uh, Twilight and company are there. They could just say, "Guys, we've just come from Ponyville, and Canterlot is under attack." They could tell the ponies this reality, 
and probably sway maybe not all of them, but a good number. Well, here, here's where another problem appears again, and that problem would be why didn't Celestia send guards or send officials to the location? I mean, there's multiple things that could have been done to... What is Shining Armor? What is the Royal Guard? Yeah, what I mean, are the Wonder Bolts? Yeah, I mean, see, th those things, like, obviously Shining Armor is at the Crystal Empire doing his thing with Cadence, but... No, I doing mean, Cadence. Ah, oh, yeah. you... He's totally doing Cadence. Ah, uh, but... Or Cadence is doing him. No, no, they're, no, moving they're, on. They're married, so it's not inappropriate. Ah, moving on, but anyway, <laughs> anyway... After... <laughs> After Twilight's diplomacy failing, King Aspen saying that he will take everything by force. And Twilight Sparkle says give her a chance and sends a letter to the two princesses. Oh, which has led to... You know what? One page seems to have inspired more rage than any other part in this comic. Luda and Celestia hanging upside down from the vines. And Luna... Bless her, making a pun. <laughs> What's so bad? What's so bad? What's so bad? I thought it was divine. <laughs> ah! uh... Killed you. Oh my gosh. Ah. Yes, it's so wonderful. But uh, but people were just upset. And I'll admit, when, they, when Celestia wrote her letter and said, we're trying to defend Cantalot against the vine, we can't come to you. I thought, okay, good. You're you're ruling out that the princesses can't come and fix the problem because they are tackling a larger threat elsewhere. But now suddenly they're the comedic relief. Well, and they're being reduced yeah. to helplessness again. Yeah. What about that one part in in the first arc that we had where Spike couldn't join the rest of the main six on that? Epic quest because he was with Princess Celestia fending the the, uh, the city of Canterlot of an attack with thousands on thousands of cockatrices. Like, yeah, that was that was actually legit. It was a good way for them to not have the princess uh, appear, to get rid of a Spike as well, and it wasn't. It, it was funny, but it wasn't comedic relief. It was actually a very funny, silly, epic moment where. It was taken on on that comic at the end of the of the actual comic that was drawn by Katie Katie Cook, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys remember that one, right? Oh yeah, yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Why couldn't they do the same thing here? Why couldn't they have Celestia and Luna fighting off the binds and doing things like that while also making puns, or I mean, not showing them just being helpless? So <laughs> find a reason to get mad at this comic. Because it gives you so many. It's, uh, yeah. It hurts. It hurts right here, right below my right booby. It oh. hurts. But <laughs> anywho, but anywho. After that, we move into issue 28. 28, where... I, <laughs> Things well, funny, get worse. Funny, funny enough, we get Celestia and Luna trying to untangle themselves. Oh, Ro Princess is starting entangled. Who knew? Uh. <laughs> but... <laughs> But, it's not as likable as Rapunzel, sadly. Now, actually, this is this is a part where to address uh, Norman's earlier point that that uh, King Aspen tried diplomacy, it didn't work, so now he's having to resort to force. But he's using force in the wrong direction. He's going after Ponyville, and the construction site is within shouting distance of his kingdom now. Now. The, the deer, and they make it a point to say this again at the start of issue 28, they say, oh, nothing can grow, uh, can grow there. Well, in that same page, you see a vine that can reach all the way up to Canterlot Mountain and vines that reach to, uh, Ponyville. You're saying you can't grow a super long vine in the Everfree territory and have it reach across to just grab even one minotaur and chuck it or drag it into the forest to be thrown in a root dungeon or some such. This, this argument that, oh no, we can't possibly fight the people who are invading us. So we'll fight the ponies who are living on the other side of the forest. Like, no, King Aspen, why are you so dumb? You look so cool, but you so dumb. <laughs> 
Uh, I, it's, uh, I, what do I add to that thing? <laughs> Just anger. Anger and rage. I don't have anything else to say. Uh, it is, it is, it, it does beg the question. Oh, what were they thinking when writing this part of the comic? Like, try to think about it. What was the purpose behind this comic? What is the, what is it trying to tell us? Is that the people that invade our territory because the ter- territory has been invaded are not as bad as the people that are invading them? Like, what? No! They're just as bad. I'm not saying even worse because they're trying to justify it. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about this, man. Like, I could give a multiple hit cannons, but the in the end, it's not gonna solve anything much because what's done is done. What's done is done, but we could so we can only move forward. Yes, move forward, then, my friends. So well, first off, King Aspen has what has got to be the most compensating th- uh, throne I've ever seen. Actually, it's <laughs> funny. I just I just saw the James Bond movie A Live and Let Die. Uh-huh. And now this throne reminds me of that peacock outfit used by Solitaire. <laughs> that you kind of sl- the chair you sit in, and it looks more like a, a cape. So, eh, nothing really there except uh, life follows a theme, I guess. <laughs> but more importantly, we learned that the reason Celestia never responded to uh, his letters is because Jargon, uh, well-to-do's hench pony who looks like Rocky from uh, Looney Tunes. <laughs> Uh, he's been intercepting every letter, which means there are probably a lot of dead birds right now. Oh, God, no. Not, not, not just dead birds, but that is... Okay, that has the same level of legality as, like, you know, when you have to... Uh, when you spy on a politician and you uh, you hack on their phone and you listen to their calls and all that, and you get all that information and then you blackmail them, that it has the same amount of douchiness to it. That is terrible. What the hell? What? <sighs> well, I, that's why I can't defend uh, what well to do. What's his name I again? Am, well, well to do is the yeah. guy, the name of the Minotaur. Yeah, I, I can't defend him at all because I find him despicable. The, it's the, the only yeah. That's but that's because that's his purpose. The purpose of well to do is to be despicable. He's the bad guy. He's going to show that in a couple of pages. I'm saving my epic rage moment for that, but I, I oh. swear to God, that is where I am going to explode. I, I, I don't want to, but it's going to happen. I, I guarantee it. I probably want to get this in before epic rage time. When I saw this page, it was part of a, the three-page preview that precludes a, a comic. I wondered, okay, is Jargon the real bad guy? Could well-to-do be oblivious to the harm he's causing because Jargon won't let him see it? And that perhaps Jargon is pursuing an ulterior motive. If that were the case, this I think this comic would have actually had a better run. Well-to-do is a fool. And a fool serves a purpose in a story by making the situation worse. If Well-to-do's construction had unwakened something in Everfree that put everybody at risk, even just a giant monster, that would have been a better solution. Yes. If, if Well-to-do thought he was just clearing some trees but didn't know the harm that was caused because of Jargon, and Jargon wanted to deface Well-to-Do and take over the business, that would have been a better story. Mm -hmm. And before before we go any further and you guys listening to us, call us out on this. This is not us reviewing the comic that we wanted to see. Okay? This is us talking about the comic that logically should have happened because this is the way that many of these stories are supposed to go. And you can still take a very interesting twist and make it different and enjoyable and original. What you end up doing with this is abs- something absolutely terrible. And this is, I, I think that is the part uh, uh, when they are talking with, uh, with well-to-do in the office and they are claiming that they're not, they are not going to make any trades with them and they're bringing back that st- the needless bureaucracy that was present on the Wild West arc with the whole, we are not going to do trades with you. This is the point, the point where it hit me, that this comic could have been fantastic because there is potential to do many awesome things with it everywhere. Like The deer would have been more likable if you dedicate more writing to them and you make them more interesting and perhaps more relatable, not so douchey and kind of like close-minded about their own plan. 
You could have made well to do a much more interesting character if you do what Silver just suggested, make him a fool and make the bad guy jargon. And if you dedicate a bit more time to do the artwork and improve on it, it could have been the best looking comic of the entire, of the entire series. I mean, you take a comic that is already good and you make it fantastic, but instead you take a terrible comic and you make it pretentious. This is so preachy and finger-wagging that it's so annoying. I hate to be repeating that, but it is. It is a finger-wagging, pretentious comic. And we're about to dash any hopes, because after a rather absurd series of, of, uh, what is it, a six-pony protest giving flaxseed and wheatgrass a quick cameo? (laughs) Yeah. and an attempted boycott where we learned that copyright law is not a thing in uh, Equestria. Uh, uh, Twilight Sporkle. The king <laughs> rightly tells the ponies to get out because, quite frankly, they're not helping. And yep. you know what's, what, what makes me sad? What? They could have left and this story would have gone exactly the same. Yeah. At, from this point onward, our heroines are completely pointless. Aspen is right. Mm-hmm. He's and right. So, they are not necessary. They are not needed. They should leave. So Bramble, Rainbow Dash, and Spike see the little guy leaving the castle to go trespassing on construction grounds, which, oh, that's a smart idea, Prince. And like I said, being proactive at the wrong time. Being proactive. He discovers that this strange all-natural uh, milkshake Somehow gets the plants to regrow, which makes me wonder what the hell's in that milkshake. <laughs> I will tell you what it is. A giant deus ex machina. Human revolution or pony revolution? <laughs> Mass Effect 3. <laughs> but Bramble gets caught. And this is where Well-To-Do starts to stops being the fool and starts trying to be the villain. Except he's a very dumb villain. Uh, he's, he uses Bramble as a hostage. Now, one might argue, oh, Rainbow Dash and Spike are there to see this happen. They can warn King Askman. Well, what does it matter? One page later, there's well-to-do and jargon with a captive Bramble in tow walking into the middle of the Deer Kingdom saying, you have to sign this contract to be our mascot or we'll never let your son go. Now, in a sane world, King Askman would say, okay, guards, seize them, untie my son, and I'll get to them in the next year or so. Hope you like the dungeon. Done. Problem solved. Yeah. If you know why, because they need to have that imagery where the bad corporate guy captures the, the, the king of the elves or the king of the Navi or the king of the, uh, of, or Whatever. the leader of the Indians or the spirit of the forest or anything. They need that moment. They need that picture. They need you to see, ah, hey, he's evil. He's bad. Uh, but still, I mean, let's just say that this could have gone better. Oh, so much better. Yeah. Dude, it could have been done so much better. Give this to anyone else. I mean, I, James Cameron is not the best writer in the world. I will say that his movies all have a lot of plot holes and a lot, a lot of problems, but in the end, he knows how to make characters likable. He knows how to make villains fun. Like, some of the funnest parts of the, his movies are the bad guys, like Billy Sand in Titanic, or the T-1000 in Terminator 2, or hell, like I said, Colonel Quaritch in Avatar. These are likable bad guys. Like, yeah, they're the bad guys, and they're evil, but holy... That's not a word! This is a lot of fun to see them being evil. This is like, well-to-do has a gun pointed to his head, forcing him to be the bad guy. He's not having fun with it, he's just a tool. And King Aspen is a moron because he's just like, well, if it'll save my son, then fine. Uh, you know, yes. and I've seen, like, I've seen wrestling matches that have more plus than this. Although, uh, after after King Aspen gets carted off, finally, we have the coolest character make his re-entrance: Blackthorn. Yeah. Da da I want to imagine his introduction with like a, a guitar solo. <laughs> Oh, because, God. but okay, you because know what, you know what, I, I have to say something. By this point where Blackthorn becomes king and the way he talks about it, him saying that he has to take over, I, I thought that, okay, this would be interesting if they in cahoots. It, it would have been. I actually wouldn't have minded if at the time Blackthorn could have been the bad guy, but as he is, he's the smartest character in this whole comic because he, th- he takes the contract and realizes this doesn't apply to me. You know what? I feel like putting an end to this. I'm going to call every badass monster in the forest, and we are going to bulldoze the bulldozers. 
<laughs> and I, I so just love the, the... what what he basically says is like, come on, I'm gonna go to the local magic shop and I'm going to make an all green deck. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> he basically I, does that. I no, just... but, okay, the, the the character of Blackthorn here, he. Okay, no, go ahead, Norman. I, I will gather my thoughts better, right, so, and you you go ahead. But uh, go on, okay, go. He, okay, you guys, what you said is true. Blackthorn here is awesome. After the revelation of this contract is null and void because blah 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 and blah 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 and he strikes up a plan and one of the few things he asks for is gather all the creatures in the Everfree Forest and take Fluttershy with them and they're like why take Fluttershy like this is just insane um, because she's good yeah and they're like uh, what's okay Applejack's line gather up all the giant monsters that live in the forest is that deer out of his mind? How are we supposed to convince them to help us? A panel later, Flashy Shy belly rubs a um, manticore. <laughs> Yay! I, I don't know how, but Blackthorn knows Flashy Shy so well. Apparently. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When I mentioned earlier that they can talk to little creatures, it kind of follows that they'd be able to communicate with bigger animals, i.e., Blackthorn says, "All you have to do is explain the situation, and they'll they'll answer the call." So, while some might argue that, "Oh, Fluttershy proves the ponies still have a role," it <laughs> seems pretty. It's implied that the deer can do this on their own. She's just there for convenience. Yep. Mm, that's why you said that they can talk to animals. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, and then, perhaps one of the saddest moments for me is when. Rarity, Pinky, and uh, Rainbow go to the site to warn King Aspen to keep his head down. And they introduce this great-looking character. They have him this king of the forest, and they humiliate him within the same arc. It's like, uh, could I at least get to know this guy first before you make him a laughingstock? All the dignity that you gave to this character gone in one single panel. Well done. Thank you, to, Kate Cook. God damn not, it. Not to mention... Uh, He's actually mad that Blackthorn is planning an attack. And I just like, oh, God, you know what? Don't rescue the king. Blackthorn for president. Yeah, do you know what? Before we go any further, I want to talk about Blackthorn because uh, I, I remember I interrupted you before. I wanted to say something. But oh, yeah, then I said, no, let me gather my thoughts. Um, I love the fact that Blackthorn is played is so straightforward. That there is no ulterior motives. There is no... Uh, uh, is a hidden agenda or anything uh, that this character uh, is other than what you see right there. He's a straightforward, lawful, good character to go with the Dungeons and Dragons theme. But I love characters like that. It's it's one of the reasons why I like Princess Cadence and Shane in Armor so much. Is because what you see is what they are. It's like okay, th- there is perhaps not much to work about it, but Blackthorn here is, I will say right now, he is more interesting than. Kevin's and Shining, mostly because he's been given a lot more development. And he is a very brave guy who's very no-nonsense. Okay, we are not going to follow these regulations. I am going to gather all the monsters. I'm going to take Fluttershy with me because she's good with animals, even though I don't see the need to have her around because we talk with animals as well. But anyway, just to give her a role to make her feel comfortable. But yeah, I mean, I like this guy. He is a great character. But if you think about it, he is a great character because everyone else is... That's not a word! ...awful! <laughs> uh, everyone I mean, else is a moron. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Twilight, is, t- Twilight is useless. Rarity is self-absorbed. Applejack is not really there. Pinkie Pie is more worried about herself than anything else. Rainbow Dash is neutered. Fluttershy is useless. Spike is annoying. King Aspen has been turned into a laughingstock. And Bramble is... Also transparent. He has the same consistency as water paper. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with this comic? Uh, it's uh, ah! And we haven't even reached my moment of rage. This is unbelievable. Stop it. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think to, we're almost at that moment because as we have two p- parties, this is the classic nature versus technology. But while, while the Ewoks and the Empire were... Yeah. Uh, sort of the underdog. You can almost tell from the way they're lining up. I have an army of bulldozers. We have a Hydra. <laughs> I have an army. I, we have a Hulk. I have a god of the earth. <laughs> uh, and here, and here's 
well-to-do with the king in tow. And all he's saying is, all he screams, all I care about is money. Money, 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 money. And, and how he, he doesn't give two figs what they gather or what's happening to their homes. Here's the question. How are you going to get money if you've destroyed your customer base? Well-to-do isn't even a good uh, straw man. Oh, straw man, even. Because the idea is he covets money above all else, but he's destroying his own source of revenue. And all you have to do is say, look, no one's going to come to this park if you if their homes are destroyed. Therefore, you, you'd profit by building somewhere else. But this guy is such a straw man, all I care about is money, that he's actually contradictory, and we don't even know why he loves money so much. He just loves money. He loves, and this is the part where I... Where it, you know how something is so good is bad that you can actually enjoy and have fun with it? This isn't. This isn't it. This is not how you do it. You, <laughs> that, that, that monologue that he has right there holding that coin saying, I, I will take down a tree, build a house, and sell it to you. I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. You say you take it. I'm the bad guy. If you take all the Captain Planet villains and you combine them together, if they are not going to be even as villains as I am because I'm the bad guy. I'm evil. Ah! Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. I think I need to go get a towel, BRB. You're, you're, you're scaring the audience. <laughs> Seriously, what the hell? It is, it's a, but that, 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 you don't do this. This is terrible. This is just, uh, 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 not even the 90s had so, uh, so flat. You know, this is not even one dimensional. This is zero dimensional. This character has no character. His character is just to be the bad guy. What is so interesting about a character who's just going to be the bad guy? I mean, that is like the bully who's just the bully, or the the the, the, the high school gym teacher who's just the high school gym teacher, and he's a douchebag. That's what well to do is here. He's a he's a douchebag. He's a he's a small eyed money center money grabbing. That's not a word. Nothing else to him. Uh, oh, well, but God. still, I mean, here's the thing, here's the thing. With the comic here, or the characteristic here, they wanted to show that he is really, really evil. And there's much better ways to do it, yet let's just say that this is not one of those moments. So after that talk, we see them saying, you know what? Creatures, attack. Let's go, let's go. And I gotta say... The scene where they're blitzing the the workers is something about the perspective. Blackthorn is huge with the with everything. It doesn't look like he's closer to the foreground. It looks like he's just become a giant. Yeah, it looks like he is in the background, leaping from the background towards the bulldozer. Because yeah, the perspective there is botched yeah, the, again. The, the, I, well, it's a it's a neat picky point compared to what I brought up before. But yeah, I mean, it, it goes to show the artwork in this comic is not as good as it used to be in the in the previous ones. Or look at that gorilla holding that bulldozer. Uh, that, that that is so weird looking in in the uh, panel right next to it. I guess it's a giant gorilla, but uh, I I think the two ponies in on the start of a page kind of sum it up. Was that it? Was that the big showdown? That was a curb stomping. <laughs> I mean, those bulldozers never stood a chance. Yep. Yeah. And, th- and thanks to the Deus Ex chemical, which is kind of funny, we restore the forest by through the use of whatever they, the chemicals they may used. Yeah, right. yeah. Maybe they are radioactive. Who, who knows? Yeah, it's a, it's supposed to be all organic, but uh, nothing organic does that. Yeah. Yeah. Not even not even not even magic grow stuff. Thinny. I don't know manure. Oh, I get it. I know what the what the green stuff is. Is all the that's not a word that we've been forced to drink throughout the entire comic. Oh, God. Get yeah. it? That's that's why it grows so well. It's all full of manure. Yes. And now I guess it's time to come to the coup de gras. That after well to do is literally seeing red. Uh, King Aspen yeah. smiles as a hydra tries to goes to eat uh well to do and Pinkie Pie. In true dark fashion, 
Offer some mint. Yeah. Mint? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, here, just... reading this, re- reading this part here where we see the Hydra going after well-to-do and turning to the next panel, it's black. I, I thought there was something wrong with my iPad. And not wanting spoilers, I continue reading and I move out from the whole thing and I saw the whole page and it's black. It's black for... Best panel in the entire comic so far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Rainbow Dash's, Rainbow Dash's um, expression there, like, oh my. Uh, there's a lot of expressions here and I let's go through them. Pinkie Pie is just... Yeah. Fluttershy is okay. Bruce Spike is okay. Rainbow Dash is like, oh my god, what have I seen? And Shh. Applejack is Applejack like, what is the? Nauseated. Are you nauseated. sure? I think they're all equally horrified in their own way. I was so satisfied. Like, I think you, you wrote it in your journal, Silver, that uh, I share the sentiment. I have never been so satisfied to see a black panel. <laughs> oh, the implications alone. And, it's so good. And we can kind of dash through the rest because once Jarkin gets his comeuppance, which is just to get thrown away, even yeah. though he even though he was equally culpable. <sighs> um, as well. Uh Commander Firebrand, another reviewer, he brought up the question the the insane mayor who tried to bring a thousand years of night got banished to the moon and then redeemed. The villain who tried to spread chaos got turned to stone, then redeemed. The emotional parasite who tried to conquer Cancelot got thrown away. Uh, the tyrant king who took over an empire got banished to shadow and then destroyed by a MacGuffin. Tyrick is back in Tartarus. The guy who abducted one prince and made a uh, speech about how much he loves money is killed. Eaten away, yeah. Now, people will say, oh, no, Katie Cook made this really funny panel where he's selling real estate in the stomach. And I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, you know, trying to be cutesy. But uh, there's this thing called digestion, my friends. Uh, Iron Will yeah. is, uh, is fixing the plumbing as the ship goes down. <laughs> uh, <and> it, <laughs> so, so the, the tone of this resolution, if he'd gotten – thrown out or lost his business or some sort of karmic justice, sure. But this is murder. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, I, I don't know what to say anything more, but... Well, no, it's like, this is the ending. We're done. Yeah. Comic review is over. The comic oh. ends. We Nobody learned anything. And we end with a stupid, silly joke about Pinkie Pie getting herself drawn as one of the glasses in the in, uh, one of the windows in the Canterlot Castle and that's how it ends yep. well, there, there, there is one other thing I'd like to mention Celestia swoops in and she apologizes to Aspen for uh, for all this happened so she didn't know and he's like oh it's alright it's like you at least could apologize for your invasion what invasion? you could you could say, I'm sorry I lashed out at your people in anger. Your ponies in anger. This, for me, the root of the problem here is moral absolutism. Corporations are totally evil and not real characters. The deer are totally victims and can't be held accountable for their own decisions. That's the root of the problem for this comic. We were given an absolute viewpoint, and I think a lot of us push back against absolutes. Yeah. I mean, the punishment, the punishment didn't fit the crime, but hey, it's ended. Let's just put it there. This comic has ended. So, ended. Uh, the, 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 okay. Conclusions. Conclusions. Yep. The, the, uh, were we just doing conclusions or did we, we jump into it without saying we, we, we were making final thoughts? Yeah. Oof. I... Uh, you guys remember 
the review that we did of the Wild West arc. Oh, yeah, I know. You remember, uh, of course, S Silver's awesome video where he reviewed the Wild West arc as well. Uh, you guys remember how mad we were uh, when reviewing. I was that, kind of trying to be neutral. Okay, okay, okay. You know how did. you know how much how much I rage and how angry I got and how much I don't like it because I don't like the Wild West arc. I rather read the Wild West arc <laughs> twice before reading uh, this comic. You know what? One James... more time. I, no, I... Just wait a minute because this comic they thought. They, they, I thought they couldn't sink deeper. They did. And then they decided to keep scrapping the bottom of the barrel until they are now 300 meters under the barrel and still scarving. I am, I, I'm not even sorry. This comic doesn't, this, this series doesn't deserve to have a comic this bad. And Katie Cook and Andy Price can do so much better. We know this. I am the, one of the few guys who defended the, the Reflections arc, uh, saying that, it is it is very interesting and involving and engaging and I like I, I personally I liked it a lot. What is with this? What were they thinking? This is a what were they thinking scenario. You know I I, I can't even blame you for this. I, I can't even say I disagree because when we're reviewing this, your rage or level of anger was not the same as in the cowboy arc. That one was. Com compared to this, that one was kind of mellow. Yeah, I, just, I I wanted to I wanted to keep it down because I didn't want to screech and scream my head off, my head off. But I was very mad. <laughs> well, I I might not give her a loop. As the lesser of two evils, I might actually go with the cowboy. Uh, I might actually go with this over the cowboy arc. For huh? two for two reasons. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry. It. Well, I I I I am treading on minefield. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Look, before you go uh, any further, this is my opinion, guys. That, that if you enjoy the comic, more power to you, everyone. But the, uh, this is not made for me. Go on. Well, I'm like I'm like the little character face in Minesweeper, little. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. The two things. Well, three things that this comic did better. Twilight was not simply saying, oh, I can't do anything because rules. She went along with some dumb premises, but so did the rest of the cast. Twilight was not the sole source of, well, stupid this time around. Granted, I'm not happy that everyone it was kind of stupid, except for reason number two, Black Thor, the coolest male character I've seen in this franchise. Yeah. And yet I am equally saddened because... I, I've often said I'd like to see guys have a more positive role that just because this is aimed at girls, I've never liked the idea of saying a gender can only look good if you make the opposite gender look silly, boy or girl. <sighs> so here's this character I like. I like that he's competent, that he's assertive, that he's finding a solution. But I would love it if he were doing that in tandem with the ponies as a team. This was not a team. This was him hurting cats. Uh... And finally, I do love the deer. Nuts to nuts to uh, the ponies of uh, Chili Pepper Ranch and uh, whatever that I I can't even remember where they were. Or Longhorn and his and his uh, cattle rustlers. Forget them. The deer are fascinating. I agree. I agree. So you've got at least those silver linings to make me say I would read this again if you held the cowboy arc and the root of the problem in front of me with a gun saying Yes, shoot. I was going to say, if you are going to hold the comics, you also need to be holding a gun. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So that's that's where I fall on the spectrum. But the last four issues of the main series, a two-part arcs, have really been a rough run. They have been an absolutely rough run. <laughs> so uh, so next next up in the main series is... A wrestling comic. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Gee, I wonder if he's excited. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'm looking forward to talking about that. And getting back to sort of, I've always felt that My Little Pony does better with a slice of life than the world adventure because the slice of life is based on the characters. Adventure is based on things happening, often at the expense of characters. Uh True. I mean, be, be, besides, if we are going to have some silliness in the comics, 
Maybe some intentional silliness, please. True, true, yes. true, true. Yes, yes. But anywho, but anywho, guys, I think that's a wrap, right? There's nothing more we can say to convince people to not read this, right? Like, honestly, from my point of view, I've, I'm a strong supporter of the IDW My Little Pony comics. Like, I would suggest people to get this when there's a huge discount. Get it, then. I buy all the comics. I, I buy it on physical format and on digital format. I buy them on Comixology and through a website called Things from Another World. I support the official release. I like these comics. They are good. But boy, lately when they, when they suck, they really suck. No, when they suck, they eat. They just don't suck. They eat. This is unbelievable. Yep. But so still, yeah, um, this one, this one, uh, on our own humble opinion, or at least in my own humble opinion, I'm not going to speak for you guys, but skip this one. You are so much better without this in your in your collection. Yeah, don't uh, even bother. As a completist, as a completist, I say get this one on a discount because getting it full price is not worth it. It's not worth. Get it, it for the cover art. Yeah, true that. But no, the cover art is beautiful. You know what, James? No, you don't get it for the cover art because there's always going to be one of those cover art collection thingies so buy that one instead of this yeah yeah exactly wait for them to release all the covers into one single uh collection and 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 buy the buy those don't buy the comic for the covers it's not yeah. worth it but still get it if you can get it cheap that's all i can say because buying it full price you're going to rage that's all i can say mm. yeah. uh for me all i all i take away from this comic is be good to the earth or all <laughs> No. Kill you, oh. Captain Planet. <laughs> Go Planet, yeah. Protect the environment, or I'll <laughs> kill you, Captain Planet. Uh, for for me, uh, I'm gonna say you can skip this one, and if you but if you hop online and do a search for the deer designs, they're at least worth seeing. But thanks to the marvels of the internet, you can see a picture of the deer without having to pay money for the whole comic. Yeah. I, I'd i like to celebrate the designs. I'd love to encourage people to buy it, if only for the deer, but that feels dishonest. It's like saying, spend your money on a dissatisfying story just to see one pretty visual. Yep. And as for me, like I said, if you're a completionist, like, I know how people are with collecting stuff, and if you really want to get all those comics at a discount, that's all I can say. So, um... James or Silver, next week, what are we going to review? Oh, gosh. Next week, I think we're going to go back to our Friends Forever you issues. Sure? Not 29? Right? Yeah. No, because I think, you know what? Even 29 has uh, its things and all that. Let's go back to that wonderful universe that is the, the Friends Forever comics, where uh-huh. you can have such weird combinations as Fluttershy with with Iron Will and see what will happen with these two guys after being you know away and apart from each other for like a couple of seasons I was excited for 29 oh don't worry we'll get, we'll see it soon we will you eventually get to it definitely in Look, the meantime yeah. you guys re- reread the all the other comics they're, they're, they're not they're, they're definitely worth your time but not this one not this one okay Ooh. Well, guys, thank you so much for checking us out, for watching the show, for listening to us, and for being there. You guys are wonderful, and we will see you in the next one. I have been James Cork. And I have been Norman Sanzo. I have been Captain Planet! Go Planet! Yay! Go. <laughs> oh, God. Heart! 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 <laughs> Suck on my big fat heart! <laughs> We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.